mayors and governors must establish an overwhelming law enforcement presence until the violence has been quelled. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. That threat sent shockwaves around the world. The president of the world's most powerful country vowing on Monday to use the military against demonstrators in his own country. Donald Trump's pledge to use the so-called Insurrection Act sparked immediate and widespread backlash, including from Donald Trump's former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, who accused the president of dividing Americans. Earlier that day, heavily armed police used tear gash and concussion grenades to disperse a crowd of peaceful protesters so the president could pose with a Bible outside a prominent Washington church. Are the president's actions even legal? Is he inciting violence as a method of crowd control, or is it his right to do so? Let's find out. Joining me now is Christine Warmoth. She's the former under Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, who served under President Barack Obama. She's now the director of the RAND in International Security and Defense Policy Center in Washington. Good to see you, Christine Warmoth. Um, what did you make of Donald Trump's threat to use the military and then what he actually did use them to disperse the protesters as he walked across Lafayette Park to visit that church for the photo op? Well, Evan, I was very surprised and very disturbed. Uh, frankly, it was it was really quite shocking, uh, and I think that's that's why you've seen the kind of backlash against the president's actions that you've seen. You know, causing former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, who has been silent since his resignation from the administration, that he came forward uh, to state how, how concerned he was about the idea that we would use the U.S. military against our own citizens. Other presidents have used the Insurrection Act before. This is from the early 1800s. If others have used it, why can't President Trump use it? Well, the, the president, whoever the president may be at any time, has the authority to use the Insurrection Act. It is, as its name implies, it is there to allow the president to put down a threat to the nation. Ironically, in the past, uh, when presidents have used the Insurrection Act to bring the military out uh, into the streets, it has actually been to protect the civil rights of American citizens. So in, in recent years, it has generally been used in the 60s and 70s to protect black Americans who were integrating into schools, for example. Uh, but, but using it or, or talking about using it the way President Trump did this week would be very different. We've seen the violence, and look, countries go through protests a lot. This is a, maybe a hinge point in history, the death of Mr. Floyd and what it's meant. But, you know, in your former job, does the, the president's view on these protests undermine the United States standing in the world, its moral and political standing, say, for example, to criticize China for its ongoing crackdown in Hong Kong? Does the U.S., has it lost moral authority to do that right now? I think this is a, um, something I'm very concerned about. Um, I, I think on the one hand, the fact that we are having as much upheaval as we are experiencing right now in the United States is causing a lot of countries like China, like Russia, other authoritarian countries to look at us and say, you know, how can you criticize us and our human rights records when, when you have all of these racial problems yourselves? So, so I think there uh, we have a concern, but certainly the way that uh, President Trump has been using the military in Washington, D.C. in particular, I think does undermine the moral authority of our country uh, to talk to other countries about use as a force. One of the things we've noticed, and I think everybody's noticed, is the, I, the militarization of the police in your country. That when we see these protesters, these aren't just police on, on uh, patrol cars. Uh, we've seen police essentially driving tanks. Uh, is that an issue in your country, the, the, the heavy militarization of the police and passing on military equipment essentially from the Afghanistan and Iraq war, essentially now getting downloaded to police uh, precincts? The Department of Defense does provide uh, excess equipment to police departments around the country. We have a program for that. 
There's been growing concern about that program for some years now. And even in the Obama administration, there were um, initiatives to look at that and really question whether that that was an appropriate use of equipment. And I think, you know, you're absolutely going to see further scrutiny of those kinds of programs in, in the wake of what's happening now. Uh, there was a presidential task force a few years ago looking at the kinds of things that police departments needed to do to reform. And one of the recommendations they had was certainly to um, really kind of decrease the, the heavy militarization of the kinds of equipment that police departments were using. And as a final question, uh, going back to the standing of the United States, it was pretty remarkable this week when you saw Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, so she doesn't want to be in the same room as Donald Trump. Uh, Justin Trudeau was asked to comment on, on Donald Trump. He had 21 seconds of silence. He wouldn't mention Donald Trump's name. I'm, I'm, you know, these are our closest allies. This is the Western alliance, as it were. Um, what's, you're the former undersecretary of, uh, of defense for policy. Is that disintegrating before our very eyes is almost 75 years of an alliance uh, getting reshifted by these series of crises right now? Well, I think there has been a tremendous amount of damage done to the strength of our relationships with our closest partners, whether it's Canada, our, our other NATO allies in, in Europe, for example. You know, this administration has continuously criticized our partners, has started all sorts of trade disputes uh, with those countries. And I think there's a lot of damage. I think Chancellor Merkel feels like time has shown her that she can't really work with President Trump. And so it doesn't, it's not, you know, it doesn't make sense for her to come here for the G7 meeting. I think there's a lot of repair that needs to be done to those relationships. And I, and I think we can, we can make those repairs, but I think also all of us, all of the, our countries need to work together to deal, frankly, with some real institutional reform to the institutions that we built up in the, in the wake of World War II to help us essentially, you know, make all of our countries rise and be more prosperous. Those institutions have gotten very brittle in the last 10 years. And I think many people in all, all of our countries feel that those institutions have not served everyone equally. So I think there's, there's real work to be done, repair work to be done. Yeah, it's a long process. I got to leave it there. Christine Warmoth, the former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the United States. Great to have you on the program. Always appreciate that. Coming up next, 21.